if we're talking about market, art market, there's no market without the artists. Mm -mm. That's just, it's, and that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And I think you do have some individuals who prey on the naivete of artists. And I think you have some artists who have this expectation that someone's going to teach it to them. Right. And that's just not how life works. Right. If you're lucky and blessed to find a mentor who dropped them jewels on you. Yeah. Like I was blessed. Yeah. But it's something that I had to go get that information. I want you guys to imagine someone who not only understands the complexities of the art world, but is also actively reshaping it. That's Larry Osei Mensa, okay? A visionary curator who has been trailblazing. And I do mean trailblazing his way through the global art scene. And when I say global, I actually mean global. His work spans continents from Manila to London to Athens, and he's earned a well-deserved reputation as one of the most influential voices in contemporary art today. I'm coining that. I don't care. I'm coining that. He is one of the most influential voices in contemporary art today. Larry has been a tireless advocate for artists in his journey from wanting to break into the music industry to becoming a powerhouse in the art industry is nothing short of extraordinary. He is also the co-founder of Art Noir, a global collective that celebrates and amplifies the voices of black and brown artists around the world. I first met Larry in Houston during the installation of an incredible exhibition by Amawako Boafo at the Contemporary Arts Museum. That was amazing to even meet him. It was because of my girl Nyla, so shout out to my girl Nyla. And let me tell you, watching his meticulous approach to curating, I wasn't able to see the entire thing, but I was there for about 45 minutes and watching his meticulous approach to curating was really inspiring. Larry's work is as much about heart as it is about intellect. And it's clear that he brings a unique blend of passion and thoughtfulness to everything that he does. In today's conversation, Larry will share his insights on navigating the art world, the importance of incremental growth and why the best partnerships often go beyond gallery representation we're going to dive deep into what it means to be an advocate for artists and explore why sometimes it's not about the gallery but about finding the right partners trust me you are in for a treat this is a conversation you will not want to miss and you won't forget and you're probably going to watch it over and over again and revisit it to remind yourself of how he navigated this art world and how you can too before i forget i'm mariah elise and this is dear glory welcome to the channel larry it's really good to see you here thank you so much for joining me today my pleasure my pleasure thank you for the invitation you know what i meant to ask you did you ever get those newspapers <laughs> that I said I did get to, okay. yes I did thank you <laughs> okay I, I always told you I got them I always yeah, wonder I about them. that like I wonder if he got those newspapers I tried to send like 10 <laughs> yeah no I got them thank you I appreciate that yeah well I know that the people that are watching this today they're going to be really really excited to see your face pop on this screen um you have a world of knowledge um I think if you're in the space of curating, if you're an artist, you, we know you. We know exactly who you are and we're watching you and we respect you and um, we appreciate you and give you your flowers because what we're watching you do on your journey, you're so graciously sharing with us on your Instagram account. What we're watching you do is not, it's, it's pure inspiration. And I'm going to let you talk about your journey, but from those of us that know your journey as an independent curator, um, I mean, I don't know that we could ask for a better example. So I want you to start off just kind of going through the start of you getting in to or being introduced to art, um, as well as saying, okay, I think I could do this into where you are now. Ooh, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation and the kind of words. Um, I would say for me, you know, I'm first generation Ghanaian American, grew up in the South Bronx. That's I would say growing up in the Bronx is probably my introduction to art. You know, in the 80s and 90s, graffiti, hip hop, culture. Although at the time, I don't think we knew that what we were participating in, help building, would turn into this multi billion dollar. You know, industry, genre, way of living. Yeah. 
And, uh, but for me, that's kind of the introduction, you know, kind of keep being confronted with public art, being confronted with folks in my community who are looking for spaces to express themselves, mm. you know, whether it be joy, whether it be frustration, um, whether it be just wanting to be seen. I think those were kind of foundational elements that I really didn't kind of come to realize until I was an adult that that's what I was seeing and experiencing. Yeah. And then going into high school, I interned from when I was 16 to 22 at different record companies. Mm. And mm -hmm. that for me was an introduction to art and commerce. And right. so what happens when you, you know, have the talent and are able to find a collaborator in the form of a record label that can then help you amplify your voice. You know, very similar to when you're an artist and if you choose to work with a gallery, mm -hmm. how do you find the right gallery partner right. to help, you know, get your work out there? Right. And so for me, I spent six years doing that. And I think that was kind of illuminating to kind of see how art and commerce can co coexist. Yeah. Um, but then what happens when there's an imbalance? And then in my... 20s, I did my grad school. So I studied business management and undergrad, studied hospitality management and marketing in grad. Did my grad school in Roche in Switzerland. And so when I was living in Europe, I basically was touring around Europe. And, you know, one of the things that I like to do because it was free in some cases was go to museums. Yeah. And just kind of look at what's there, you know, what was being shown. Yeah. And I was also photographing those experiences and just, you know, documenting it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I started my blog around that time on my global hustle to try to share these experiences with people in my network. Yeah. Well, wait, you, what did you call your blog? My global hustle. What I heard of a nickname they call you. Uh, they call me Young Global. <laughs> so that's, that's a nickname <laughs> um, that my friend Steve gave me back in 2004. Yeah. Because I was just kind of young and curious and wanted to travel the world. And I remember meeting Quincy Jones and, you know, trying to ask him, you know, what's what's the secret to life? Yeah, you know, of course. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a naive 24-year-old. And, yeah, you know, the thing he told me was see the world, see how other people live, mm. how other people move, how other people create. Mm. Because that will give you a fuller perspective of what's happening in various communities. Yeah, as opposed to just kind of like operating in this one silo, thinking that the immediate world around you, the environment that you grew up in, is the only mm -hmm. way to live and see and experience the world. And so yeah. I took him the task on that, and um, I've been doing it the last twenty years now. Uh, it was so, forty-four in June. So. I want to zoom in on that for a second because. Um, I find it really important. I've worked in multiple industries as well and landed here in the arts. Like that's where my heart is, but so have you like working in the music industry. I'm very positive. It has informed the way that you work also in the art world and being able to meet people like Quincy Jones and be that close to that amount of greatness. And I'm sure you've met, I know you've met others because you, you're documenting some of it and, and, just in my experience, and I'm I'm positive, I know this has to be in your experience, being able to be in proximity and be in conversation, even if it is that one answer, like Quincy Jones gave you, what, what did working in that space and being in that proximity, how did that inform the way that you work now? I mean, I think for me, it, it showed that anything is possible. Yeah. Right, because it's like, you know, from 16 to 22, I worked at record companies. I wanted to be an L.A. Reed. I wanted to be, you know, um, so many incredible record men, right? Mm -hmm. People who, like, spotted talent, cultivated the talent, gave them a platform, not just, like, looking at an algorithm. Yeah. Right? And having yeah. a vision that, you know, this talent is beyond what I'm seeing in front of me. Yeah, that sculpt culture. Yeah, of, yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, that's how I tend to engage with artists. Where I may meet an artist, someone is kind of just making an assessment of the practice based on what they're seeing. But for me, it's like, you know, trying to get a sense of their background, 
yeah. um, their interests, their passion, you know, do they have a drive that's different from what any other artist would have, you know, because it's not just about mm. being technically talented, talented. Mm. you know, what are the ideas? Is it different? Is it tapping into the zeitgeist? Is it tapping into something maybe we're not thinking about? And then, mm. um, you know, how open are they to critique and feedback and discourse around the podcast? And so it's very similar things. Yeah. And so for me, you know, and also just learning the importance of communicating with an artist, which I think is like a ever evolving exercise where like, you know, understanding the temperament of an artist. Mm. Um, some artists need guidance. Other artists just need someone to just say, hey, you're going in the right direction. Right. It's, it's really like a situation. Right. But I think for me, it just taught me the importance of advocating for their artists. Right. Advocating for myself not having an expectation that any institution is going to have your well-being in mind. Right. And then also just doing your best to learn the P's and Q's of the industry. So when I was interested in like potentially having a career in music, I read all the books, you know, I read Kashi's book, which is like a Bible. If you're um, entering into the, into the record industry. Yeah. And so, um, what what are royalties, mechanical royalties, sync licensing, like all the very Gotta unsexy figure it stuff. Out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that for me I learned was important. Mm -hmm. Because even though you might not have your hands in the weeds, like when you look at a balance sheet, when you do an audit, when you get a statement, you don't know if something is wrong. Yeah. If you have that fundamental understanding. And that's the same thing that I encourage artists, you know. When you're working with galleries or dealers, museums, you know, ask questions, understand the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, that's such a sticky situation. I, I hear a lot of artists, they're nervous to ask those questions. And nervous I know. Of, the is, and, that, and I don't understand that. Nervous about what? Like, yeah. They're at nervous. The end of the day, but if you're good, you're good. Right. Right. And at the right. end of the day, you got to understand. And this is like cliche, understand your worth and being able to negotiate that. Mm -hmm. Because it's very, very few times where like you'll have a dealer who'll be like, you know what? You're worth this and, and this is what's fair. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, whoever you're working with, they're going to do what's in the interest of them. Yep. And I think the artists, you know, at the end of the day, if you choose, this as a career path. Yep. You can't be nervous. Yeah. Nervous doesn't pay the bills. And you nervous. <laughs> tell them again. Nervous don't pay the bills. <laughs> nervous don't pay the bills. Nervous, nervous doesn't buy the materials. Yeah. It doesn't pay for your studio. Um, nervous. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm not saying don't be nervous. I think that's a natural human feeling, but I think that's when you have to really identify that where's the gaps in knowledge that I have. Yes. So that I can be prepared. Yes. So when I do engage in these scenarios, whether it's working with a curator, dealer, historian, collector, I understand the scenario. Mm -hmm. Right. And I understand yeah. my role in the scenario. And I'm able to negotiate from a position of understanding. Right. Right. Because at the end of the day, if we're talking about market, art market, there's no market without the artists. Mm -mm. that's just it's and that's just a fact mm -hmm. and I think you do have some individuals who prey on the naivete of artists and I think you have some artists who have this expectation that someone's going to teach it to them right. that's just not how life works right. if you're lucky and blessed to find a mentor who dropped them jewels on you yeah like I was blessed yeah but it's some of it I had to go get that information yeah so how so how did you get it Where where did you go I mean, I know you said you within when you were trying to be a record guy, you you read all the books that you could read. What I have found many people say, which is why we're doing what we're doing now, is that they're they can't find the information. They that's not true. Yeah. There Ooh. there are books out there. There are many books out there. There are many conversations out there. Um, but a lot of artists are not guided, and that nervousness comes from 
going into a space, going into someone that's giving you an opportunity that might throw a price on your work and it might be overpriced. It they're might give, be they're giving you they're giving you a they're making a business proposition. Yeah, it's negotiable. I think I think <laughs> I think I think that word opportunity is a slippery slope. Mm. And I think you have some people who like, you know, you may have been grinding for X amount of years and finally if someone's giving you some attention, you don't want to mess it up. And I right. think, you know, but there's a reasonable way to approach this thing because at the end of the day, it's your work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yes, be appreciative of the proposition that's being made, mm -hmm. but don't become subservient in the situation. Right. Right? And at the end of the day, particularly when you have a generation that's digital natives, you know you can go to the internet. Mm -hmm. You know you can go to Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, LinkedIn. There's enough video conversations and IG chats and where people are sharing. Like I just, you know, I jumped on a chat with Deborah Roberts the other day. And Deborah, every first Saturday, you know, brings on different folks. My boy, Kenny Rivero, just dropped his book. You know, um, there's plenty of outlets. You got to be hungry for the information. Yeah, you got to be hungry. I, mean, I think... That's that's a good point. Yeah. You, you have to be hungry for it and you have to go out there and you have to get it because it's definitely there. Um, but just like you, I have kind of forced myself into situations where I do. I've had many mentors and many people that have poured into me. And, you know, I think that's what it takes as artists or art enthusiasts or whoever you are trying to navigate this ecosystem is understanding that it is an ecosystem and there are many different places you can go we went deep real quick so i want to like take us back for a second um you said you want to go deep i know i do want to go deep i do want to go deep we got there faster than i thought yeah um okay so because i still want folks to understand your journey and you stopped at you know you went um you were trying to be a record man and yeah but there's a real, lot in between realized... yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I just realized that, that that wasn't my journey. That wasn't my path, right? And so um, went worked in advertising, decided to go back to school. And during that time, you know, picked up photography as a hobby, started my blog, and really was just trying to document the things I was seeing and experiencing, yeah. not only for myself, but for people in my community that may not have an opportunity to visit a lot of these places. Yeah, And when I moved back to New York, you know, I started doing exhibitions of my photography. And, you know, I was 27 at the time, something like that. But I'm just trying to find my way. You mm -hmm. know, what's my way? You know, since I decided to kind of go more corporate and, you know, did my first exhibition in 2008 uh, with my buddy Stanley Lumax. And that was thanks to, you know, my homegirl, Layla and uh, Ngozi, who had a store called Harrods onto Ego and Flatbush. So the first exhibition I did was in the back of a you know boutique in Brooklyn. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't in a white cube space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, but I just loved how I gathered our community. Mm -hmm. And I loved how, you know, we were able to do for ourselves, um, tell our own stories. Yeah. And not necessarily have to be dependent on some entity in order to platform our voices. Right. And Very then from there, you know, you, you just you grow, you evolve, you build relationships, started writing about art, mm. and then realizing that there weren't enough platforms, particularly for Black and Brown artists to have their work be seen. You know, because this is 2009, 10, it was only a handful of galleries that might be showing Black artists. Otherwise, you know, you had to go to spaces like the Incredible Rush Arts, which gave me an opportunity to curate a show, but just be part of that Rush family. A rush provided an opportunity for so many artists over the last 30 years. Yeah. And then, you know, slowly you see things changing. And, you know, for the first seven years of my professional career in the arts, I had a job. You know, so you know, I was doing it purely for the love because I wasn't dependent on the income. Yeah. And then 2015, you know, under the encouragement of, of my boss at the time, Angelina Sierra, um, I was kind of pushed into doing it full time. Yeah. And, you know, at first I was like hesitant. But then, you know, the universe put things in my, my, in my, 
in front of me to kind of confirm that this is the direction that you need to go. Yeah. And, you know, I just took all the, the years of, you know, that corporate life and, you know, grinded for somebody else and said, all right, hmm. I'm going to grind for myself. I'm going to grind for the artists who um, I'm collaborating with. And so, you know, I would say in earnest in the last 10 years, I've really just kind of been focused on just purely curating. Um, had the opportunity to co-found Art Noir and just really try to create a lane for myself because I didn't really see too many examples of independent curators mm -hmm. who were thriving um, yeah. in a way that wasn't dependent on one entity or another mm -hmm. in order to survive, right? And right. so for me, it was like, how do I chart a path that could be an example to other independent curators that you don't have to wear 10 hats in order to like, thrive and have a life yeah. and be productive, you know, do what you do, but still, you know, live a productive life. And I think at the time it was like, you know, you could be art advising, you could be consulting for an institution, you could be editing. You, know, you probably have to have like three or four jobs in order to like call yeah. together, like, you know, a respectable salary. It's been mm. um, for me important to kind of, shift that dynamic so that people can really focus on what it is they want to focus on. So yeah. it could be curating and advising. It could be, you know, purely research. Yeah. Right. And so it's just been interesting to see how things have evolved over the last couple of years. You know, is what were you scared in doing this? And, you know, we talked about nervousness earlier from the perspective of the artist. Um, but from the perspective of an independent curator going into the quote unquote art world that has many different layers to it, um, that doesn't respect or accept a black man or a black woman in this case, or, you know, in being independent and saying, okay, well, I'm going to start in the back with my own work and then progressing through your journey becoming a writer and trying all of these different things until you got to the point to where you're like, I need to focus on something. I know that journey. I've watched folks have it. And I know, I know it's, I know that it's not straightforward. It's, yeah. it's a roller coaster I, of emotions yeah. and thoughts and what should I do? And Well, I mean, I think I'm the type of person that once I make a decision, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, there's no <laughs> wavering. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is what it is, right? Um, so, I, yeah, definitely in the beginning, I was scared because it was like, how am I going to pay my rent? Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, through the grace of God, I met, um, I had met Brooke Anderson, and Brooke was running a prospect at the time. And she had mentioned ICI to me. And ICI was running this curatorial intensive in New Orleans. And literally, I think she may have told me two days before the deadline. And, you know, with Brooke's support, um, Rashida Bumber's support, Franklin Sermon's support, mm -hmm. I applied. Um, and, you know, I luckily was accepted and I was able to participate in that intensive. And in that intensive, I met so many incredible curatorial colleagues who are now all doing their thing. Yeah. You know, whether they're, you know, senior curators or directors of museums or running things, right? Mm, yeah. So, you know, that's why I said, you know, the universe put things in my path to just confirm the steps. Yeah. And I think yeah, once those yeah. things started to happen, because it wasn't, you know, once I made the decision and committed to it, then things just opened up and there was like less friction, mm, right? Mm. And so it's just like, you know, sometimes there are friction in decisions that you make and you got to kind of decide, is this something that I need to persevere? Is this the right decision? Yeah. And I'm always looking for kind of like, you know, signs from the universe and like, yeah, this is it. Yeah. And once I get that sign, I just go. It's moving we'll time. Ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and at the, at the end of the day, I think also like being, you know, a child of immigrants, growing up in the Bronx, like, you develop these survival tactics, right? Yeah. And it's just like at the end of the day, like if this is what I'm gonna do, you know, this is what I'm gonna do. And I gotta just yeah. figure it out, right? And you have that hustler's mentality 
where it's like, all right, what do I got to do to pay the rent? What do I got to do to make sure bills is covered? Mm. You know, but also make sure that I'm happy and satisfied on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I would say in the beginning I was scared, but then it was just like, you know, I think that's also kind of like the beauty of the relationships that I've built mm. over my life, where there were just people who sometimes unsolicited, you know, and, and you know, the spirit might attack them and be like, yo, we're doing a good job. Yeah. You know, and I was like, where'd that come from? You yeah. know, and I think, you know, we're blessed if you have those moments where people just kind of validate what you're doing, validate the direction you're going. Yeah. But you also have to be kind of open and aware that that's happening at the moment. Yeah. And so, you know, once I made that choice, you know, it was full steam ahead. You know, I collaborated with, you know, brothers like Dexter Wimberly, mm-hmm. and we did about three, four shows together. And you find your tribe, you know, and I think also, you know, I was lucky that I also had put people who pulled me aside to give me game. Mm. And I was doing too much. Mm. Right. And I was like, all right, that's cool that you got these five things going on, but you yeah, yeah. Oh, that's important you know, right need, there. You that... know, you need to prune the tree yeah. uh-huh. and just get it down to this one or two things. Mm-hmm. Right. Because like, you know, early in my career it was about being that multi hyphenate. I'm a I'm a curator, I'm a writer, I'm a film producer, I tap yeah. dance. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like I found people um struggling to make introductions yeah people who were trying to put me in power positions man and they were like damn he he does so much i can't even quantify it yeah and that's why I, like you know a lot of times now it's just like i curate i do a lot of other things but that allows me to kind of focus yeah and then i can point you to the examples of the work that i've done yeah. and you know there are other things that i do outside of curating but it's like you know reading the room but then also kind of understanding that you know, the art world is what it is and you're going to have people who are going to try to qualify you or test you mm-hmm. and not follow for that, mm-hmm. right? Because it's like, when you say, oh, I curate, mm-hmm. the first thing they're going to be like, oh, where do you curate? A well, museum, museum yeah. gallery? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, and in the beginning, I, I took that as a slight. Sometimes that's what it was. And then you learn how to navigate those things. And it's just like, nah, I'm independent. Yeah. And then you drop, you drop those keywords they need to hear. Yeah. So they can shut up. Yeah. You know? no, so I want to I want to talk about that. Dropping those keywords. That's nothing but understanding the language. Now, before we jump back into our conversation, I want to quickly share some exciting opportunities with you. If you're passionate about art or you're looking to grow all of your skills, you will not want to miss these. First up, I'm hosting a free webinar on introduction to art collecting on September 18th, 2024 from 7 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Remember, that's Eastern. We're going to cover everything you need to know to confidently navigate the art market, identify valuable artworks, identify artworks that you love, set a budget, and make informed purchasing decisions. This session is perfect for anyone that's looking to start building their own collection. Now, next on October 16th, 2024 from 7 to 7 30 p.m eastern i'll be leading another free webinar called effective exhibition planning it's tailored for artists and curators who want to master the basics of planning and executing an art exhibition we're going to dig deep into process and concept development budget financial planning and even tips on um, pricing your artwork and so much more if you guys don't know if you haven't heard of my other in my other videos i just finished writing a workbook on effective exhibition planning it's 200 pages and it's filled with so much information it's filled with guides it's filled with real life example and it's also filled with worksheets for you guys to fill out and do the work on your own it's something you're going to want to have in your library to reference when you're planning your art exhibition that book drops on october the 2nd make sure you guys look out for it and make sure you join the wait list so you know when it comes out that is the link for that is in my description the link for that is in my description and in in understanding when you step into these rooms and you're having these conversations with people, do your, just keep being a learner. Um, so that when you are in these conversations, you can have the language to, especially when you're in a position like you were in, you're an independent curator. Um, people are, like you said, trying to qualify you. They're sliding you because let's be real. They were sliding. And that's a lot of times, you know, that's what, that's what it is. But the thing is, I also realize that most of them don't know shit. Yeah, no, they're and and, and it's, so it's a, just it's, like once you, uh huh, once you realize that, 
then it's just like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You try, like the next person. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm getting it from the mud. What you getting it from? Right. Okay. You talk on it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but once you know that and you build the yeah. confidence, and I think the key thing is showing up as your, your full self. Yeah, full self. And I think sometimes, you know, by virtue of whatever industry you're in, you got to assimilate in order to get through that front door. And for me, I kind of made the decision. I'm just going to be me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm too old to be trying to be something else. You yeah. know, and I think being yourself is your competitive advantage. And but understanding you, that. You made it from this is this independent route, but you're in the museums now. You are all over the country um, curating. And there's there's a lot of respect we have to put there um but I, what i'm what i'm curious about is what is that one exhibition cuz you spoke about okay i got to i'm 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 curious i'm balancing all of these things because i don't have a job anymore i need to pay my rent that's a reality i feel like a lot of people that that's a middle ground a lot of people get to how did you push through that and what was the one project that put you in that financial stability to where that met, you know, all of the emotive things that you had going on. Like, I mean, yeah. I've learned <laughs> when you live in a capitalist environment, there's never financial stability, <laughs> right? It's yeah. like you could have $20 million. Ooh, and, and not be and financially. There's stable. always more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you do the things in terms of like, you know, having a savings, you know, doing some investment, like, you know, you do the things that allow you to like have a nest egg for the future. Yeah. But you know, we've been, you know, coming from where I come from, you've been conditioned to always want more. Yeah. Right? And that's mm-hmm. just something that I have to decide. Is that something I need to learn? Hmm. Or that's just who I am. Hmm. Right. Um, I was ta- I was but, in a know, conversation yesterday about that in particular because I'm that way too and my friends are as well and it's a hard it's a hard balance because and we spoke about um I heard a pastor say just because uh, let me find it it's some it's, it's the words content and complacent in the same sentence and you can be content and not be complacent that's what it was mm-hmm. you can be content and not be complacent and for me, that solved that that thing of wanting to unlearn, wanting more, um, because I'm like I'm con- I'm happy with where I am, I- I'm happy with the things that are around me, with what's going on, but I still I still want to work, and yeah, yeah and there's there's that idea of like saying, all right, I'm grateful and I'm and I'm giving all the glory to God right now, but or not even but but and. <laughs> there's this next goal that I, I want to achieve, you know? Yeah. I think for me, like, it's just how I'm programmed. I'm yeah. always like, what's the next level? What's the next play? Yeah. Right. Um, I'm always grateful, but I'm not the person that's like reflective in that way. I kind of do the project and keep it moving. Mm. And I leave that to God willing, some PhD student will find when I'm doing interesting. I'm trying to keep all the archives, let them do the research. Yeah. And for me, it's like moving on to the next project. And, you know, that probably isn't the greatest mindset. You know, I'm always learning from what I'm doing. Right. But it's like I'm not um, dwelling in it, right? Because I know there's so much work that needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, there's still so much room for growth. There's still a lot that I want to say as a curator. Mm. Um, and, you know, but I think, like, I've taken the last month off. I was in Ghana for three weeks. I've been in Dakar for a week. So, like, in these moments, I may have those moments of reflection. But I'm also thinking about, all right, what's the next play? What do I want to do in the next year? You know, yeah. what have I done that has clicked and worked? What hasn't worked? And then mm. where have I challenged myself? And then back to your question about, I wouldn't say that was a show that kind of like put financial stability like in play. 
but I would say like, you know, the show I did, um, I was introduced uh, to Susan Cross by Jack Tilted. Um, mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Jack. Mm -hmm. um, and Susan is a curator at Mass Mocha. And we met, I want to say like 2017, something like that. Um, and we had a conversation in the dialogue. Yes, 2017, because I did Art of Mind last summer. And just got to know each other. And she wanted to collaborate. And, you know, we just collaborated on Alice and Janae Hamilton's first museum show. Yeah. You know, Pitch. And that was my first time curating in the museum. The exhibition was up for a year. We did incredible programming and learning from Susan, who's been in the game for a long time, like how to just kind of conduct myself, you know, in the institutional format versus like a commercial. Mm. And that for me was just like such an eye-opening experience. We learned a lot from each other. Allison was someone that I had gotten an opportunity to get to know, you know, watch them go on their journey at Columbia and, you know, feeling like they were really at this right point to do this show and present this body of work. Yeah. And so I think that for me was an inflection point. And from there, you know, the institution as a platform became a lot more viable for me. Yeah. And then I had an opportunity to be the senior curator at MOCAD in Detroit. Yeah. And, you know, with incredible curators like Joe Valen, who's now the artistic director at MOCAD, and understanding, you know, the opportunities within the institutional framework, within where their challenges, and then how do you kind of assess both and then add value, right? So it's not enough yeah. to say, all right, I'm gonna do an exhibition. I have an exhibition up now with a Michael Waffles of a Waffles work at the Denver Art Museum. And it's not enough to say, okay, we wanna do a show in Denver, but it's like, all right, how are we tapping into the community? Yes. Right. And collectively we decided, okay. You know, let's do a reading room. Let's partner with the Denver Public Library. Let's yeah. kind of illustrate where the literary or literature kind of informs the ideas and the practice, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just presenting these paintings, but now you're presenting these different strands of intellectual discourse yes. to kind of like broaden how you engage with the work. Yeah. And these are things you just kind of learn by doing, observing. I've been blessed to get to know a lot of other curators who are like killers at their craft. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's also the other thing, an important decision I made that I'm not in competition with my colleagues mm -hmm. in terms of like the pie is big enough for all of us to eat and contribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might be in competition with the show you do. Yeah. You make a show <laughs> and I'm just like, man. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you it. And I'm going to tell you that, yo, you killed that. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, how am I going to chop Chop that show's head off. Oh yeah, okay, it's okay. Something even yeah. and sharper, right? Yeah. So it's more steel sharpening steel in terms of like the curatorial offering, mm -hmm. but it's like how do you operate, you know, to the best of your ability from a place of love, um, solidarity, and just trying to see each other win, right? Right. Because for me, that's what it's about. It's like the more of us can operate at our highest potential and do the things that feed us, do the things that we're curious about, do the things yes. that we're passionate about, the more we kind of reframe the conversations that are happening, you know, whether it's in the institution, whether it's in the gallery, yeah. um, whether it's just research, whether it's in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's what I've been on. You said a lot just now that I, I had like a thousand questions pop up as you were saying different things. Um, one was, you know, with I'm Waka Buafo, you guys being in Denver right now, y'all, you all came to Houston also. And you, mm -hmm. you know, you travel a lot, you go all over the world. And one thing that I do wonder about, you know, why you're why you're curating an exhibition, like you said, you're involved in the community and you're finding different ways for the community to to learn and you're using this exhibition or this show as a learning tool to stimulate other conversations. When you go into these cities, especially like a city like Houston or even a city like Denver, who our our art ecosystem is vibrant, but it's not bolstering. Um, do you, are you cognitive? I'm sure you are, but are you cognitive of the impact that you're having on the arts ecosystem in the city, in in the local city that you're that you're traveling to, that you're doing this work in? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think for me. 
back to your questions before about how I come to engage with art, I'm always thinking about how do you make these experiences accessible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, accessible to a multitude of people. Accessible to folks who may not feel like um, these experiences were designed for them. Yeah. And, um, you know, also kind of helping people understand that there's so many kind of cultural centers. I think people forget in the case of Houston, you know, it's third, fourth, it goes back and forth for Chicago, largest city in the United States. Yeah. So why shouldn't they have a world-class exhibition yes. featuring the work of a Marco Marfo? Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm always conscious of that. And I always, to the best of my ability, try to collaborate with the entity in that city and find out ways that we can go beyond just what people experience in the museum. So like, even with the public library, that started when we took the show to Seattle, right? And to make it accessible, you know, I'm a big library person, you know, growing up in New York, New York Public Library, go get my books, it was free. This is free game, free knowledge, right? right. And then to right. then couple that with an exhibition that has a lot of layers to it, mm -hmm. um, that allows you an opportunity to bring in an artist that may not have come to see and experience the show. And then you create this nice back and forth. And, you know, I think with Houston, it was interesting because cats came from all over the state. Like, yeah. Because yeah. because where are we? We don't have anywhere, you know? And it's, it's like Houston's so big. And I feel like we have, we have what it takes to be a really strong ecosystem. But seeing you come to Houston and seeing Amawako come to Houston and seeing like, what would be considered like art superstars in this space talking that means something that that gives that gives a lot of hope you know and and in in the art world is is different from the music world and the film world into in, in the way that media like mass media makes musicians superstars and you know but this is much of a, more of a niche market to where you got to know the superstars but when they're in mm -hmm. your city, you pay, you pay so much respect to that. And for them to touch ground, it's the same thing with you meeting Quincy Jones and, and being in his space and being in his proximity, being that close to him. It makes you feel like your city has the ability to take it a step further. Um, so, you know, you traveling to these places and, and doing these things. I know you even went to Manila. And, mm -hmm. you know, and you did the exhibition with Tim Tan. Tim Tan's my guy. I love Tim Tan. Like, he's one of the first yeah. people that encouraged me to do this channel and could, to keep doing this channel. And even even that, like, what what how are you putting together a group of African and Black, American Black artists in an exhibition in one, with one of the biggest collectors in Manila? You know, that that is that was groundbreaking for so many of the artists in that show. It changed their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I mean, changing that, careers. <laughs> I'm doing my part. You know, I yeah. think I'm, I'm always careful when it comes to that, because like I'm a Gemini and I know I'll, oh, okay. that can go off the rails. <laughs> well, I'm get, an Aquarius. Y'all my favorite people. A, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's a synergy. And I think... Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, I'm I'm just doing my part and really just helping amplify a creative voice that was already there, right? And just needed some encouragement, needed someone to, you know, have a sounding board, need someone to just show they care. Yeah. I think in the case of the show that you're referring to, Sounds of Blackness, that came from a conversation me and Tim were having dinner in Paris. And Tim was like, hey, I got this idea for a show. And, you know, the Philippines wasn't necessarily uh, a space that I was thinking about doing an exhibition, but I'm like, yo, bet, you know, Tim, Tim, Tim is passionate and incredible collector. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we started the conversation around the show in earnest this year, last this time last year, and we put it together. There was Tim and a handful of other collectors in Asia who really were committed to being stewards of artists work like Ashabala Lassav, um, Rashid Johnson, mm -hmm. Marco Boafo, mm -hmm. Tony Ojianatola. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, what I came to realize is that just like how I said Houston, why don't they deserve world-class artists? 
the same thing for Manila. And like, yeah. Manila has a scene. And there's a lot of incredible artists there, right? But I think a lot of them hadn't had an opportunity to see these artists coming um, from another part of the world in in real life. Yes. You know? and so what is it to see, you know, Vaughn Stan's work in person? Yes. Right? And to understand that, like, you know, those rainbow paintings are on terry cloth. They're not on canvas, mm. right? So to think about like, how is this artist thinking about process and material and manipulating it in, their, in order to articulate and express their ideas, right? Right. And so for me, that experience was like a game changer because it made me realize that I wasn't as global as I thought I was. Mm. So you have this whole segment of the world that is hungry to be in dialogue and discourse, right? And yeah. I had done a show in Hong Kong in 2022 um, with Ben Brown on um, Fine Arts, but I hadn't had an opportunity to go because they were still coming out of COVID. Yeah. So this was my first time to be able to go to a show that I was curating in Asia and, you know, continue to explore, for me, this relationship between these diasporas and communities. And, and then, you know, I have a show opening on January 16th in collaboration with Mickey Ming called mm -hmm. Cross Current. And that's celebrating Black diaspora, Asian diaspora, and that's going to be in San Francisco at 419, um, which is a multi-purpose space in Soma. And continuing my interest to kind of look at the relationship between these diasporas, right? Yeah. And for me, it's a reevaluation of what solidarity looks like, Yeah. right? Because I think for me, there's power in, you know, this collaborative exercise through these different diaspora voices, you know? Another project, you know, I'm collaborating on. Um, that'll be at the Hammer, March second. So working with the Here and There Collective, um, AAPI initiative. So you know, for me now, I'm at the point where it's like, all right, how do we look at what different communities, entities, organizations, thought leaders are doing, and then come together like Voltron to kind of expand these conversations. Right. and cross-pollinate these communities, right? Because right. that's really where the strength is going to lie as we move forward, you know, in this kind of super uncertain Margin. time and environment, yeah. market, yeah. all that, and just understanding what people are doing, exchanging notes, exchanging game, mm -hmm. um, and working, working, you know, to the best of our ability in collaboration. Yeah. yeah. And so you're, where you were as a curator in 2020, of 2019 what's the difference in your practice and in the messaging you're you're conveying between that time and now um i try to be a lot more communicative with the artists um when there's an opportunity be high touch be higher touch right mm -hmm. because it's very easy when you're doing a group show to just say hey artist a b c yeah you know let's do this thing and then you don't talk to them for like three months yeah you know but constantly checking in and just making sure they're good right mm -hmm. um because life happens right and i think you know it's some made me a lot more attuned to like just life happening and like that it might not have anything to do with what's happening in the studio yeah um and constantly reminding myself that like what makes this industry different are the relationships yeah right because for me, I'm without the relationships, I'm not able to work in collaboration with the different stakeholders who make a lot of these projects happen. I think in terms of Art Noir, who's also going to collaborate on the on that symposium at the Hammer on March 2nd, we expanded the work that we did, you know, starting the Jar of Love micro grant. And we were able to award over a hundred thousand dollars in micro grants. Mm. Because that's a lot of cultural workers, artists, you know, they were struggling, you know, and we saw that the, the need was definitive and serious and we continue to do that into 2024. Yeah. Right. Starting yeah. a scholarship in partnership with CUNY. So really just trying to constantly reassess how can we be of service? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So whether that be monetarily, whether that just be you know, just being available to be a sounding board. Yeah. And I think also, you know, for me, making sure that I'm implementing self-care for myself, right? Yeah. It's very easy. 
is I could be working on five exhibitions at the same time and not really taking time out to make sure I'm out. Yeah, right? for sure. And I remember, you know, I had a health scare a couple of years back and, you know, I had one of the big homies who's like, you know, you, you can't be of service if you ain't in health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't do what you do unless you're healthy. So we need you to like focus, get right. So then you can continue to do the things you're doing and take, keep taking it to another level. So yeah. I think just a lot more tool to the human aspect of it. But I think also being a lot more conscious of the ebb and flow of the market. Yeah. And I think that's something I tried to communicate with artists, you know, in the beginning, because I think we had a lot of artists who benefited from that 2020, 21 moment, yeah. you know, made a lot of money. Yeah. You know, if they were smart, they saved their money, they invested yeah. their money, they bought yeah. the property. If yeah. they weren't, then they bought uh -huh. things that, you know, mm -hmm. are depreciated. You know, they didn't save for a rainy day. Yeah. And now that the market is kind of adjusting, they're struggling. I right? want to talk about that. The, <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about that. They didn't put that. the hours in it. They, they didn't put the hours in the gym. You know? Yeah. Uh -huh. And a lot, you know, I mean, look, it's basic economics. Mm -hmm. Being an artist is a marathon. It's not a sprint, mm -hmm. right? And I think one, I feel like a lot of emerging artists were really overpriced and really didn't take that agency to step in and be like, you know what? I know that you think you can get X for my work, but I think it should be at this right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Like for it to go from like five to twenty, make crazy. And it's just like you know, I collect as well. Yeah. So when I see that, I'm like, all right, that ship sailed. I'm good. Let me move on. Yeah, man. Right. I seen a lot of that, and uh, I, I hated to see it. And I, it, it, it you know, but if you st and that goes back to the beginning, it's like, I try to encourage artists to understand that you're studied in numbers, and so beyond, beyond all of the emotive aspects and the aesthetic aspects and the cultural and geopolitical aspects that go into what shape our perspectives around art, there is a chart. There are many charts. There are many lines and many graphs that, that show what, what artists are leading the charge, what genre should be collected next year, what the experts are saying. There's a there's a ton of information out there about predictions. There's a ton of information about the past year or the fair or, you know, and for you to understand the trends that are going on in the market. And although artists shouldn't follow these trends, you got to have some type of understanding of what's happening in the industry that you belong to, that you are working within. So to your point, these artists, I feel like had, you know, they were working with galleries that gauged their prices all the way up and they might have had a good show. They might have sold everything. It might have been picked up by some collectors that brought it to auction. It might have been flipped. I mean, there were so many things that happened in that 2020, 2021, even 2022 time period that have a lot of artists in a real troubling time right now. Yeah, and I think on top of that, they weren't putting the hours in the gym. Yeah. Right. So at the end of the day, it's like, all right, if the work's twenty thousand, I want to see that. Yeah. If I look at it and I'm just like, you making the same thing you was making five years ago. Yeah. You know, you know, because for me, it's about incremental growth. Yes. Right. And evolution. Even if you're exploring the same idea, you've kind of shifted how you explore it, shift the materials, shift the form. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to, you know, they're investing in your ideas. Yes. And they want to know that you are making the efforts to experiment, to challenge yourself, to improve, to get better. Mm -hmm. And this should be for yourself. Forget what outsiders are thinking about. Like for yourself, you want to get to another level, find new challenges. Yeah. Because I think that's what makes the journey much more interesting. Right. But if you are trying to make work to satisfy a market, mm -hmm. you're going to just regurgitate the same idea. Same things. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll say like a high quotient of collectors are collecting with their ears and not their eyes. Mm. Right. And so they only want the thing that when they're hosting the house party, they could be like, oh, I have a this, this, and that. 
It's a vanity you know? thing sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, and yeah. it's no consideration in the, in the ideas of the artists. Well, and how so, do you, you know? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, I think so. A lot of young artists, you know, I think it's good that they're experiencing it now. Um, and that they did, you know, do the appropriate things in terms of like, if you have the capacity to buy some property that you own, yeah, right, that's an asset, yeah. Um, as opposed to just buying the whip and like the latest jewelry, which I understand we all want to reward ourselves, but if you're yeah. thinking 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead, regardless of what the market is doing, if you got a roof over your head. And all you got to worry about is mortgage. If, if you're in a great, great situation, property tax. Yeah. Then you can really create on your own accord, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's life, right? Like, you have to learn um, from these situations. And hopefully it puts the battery in your back to not be in whatever position you're in. Because I think the worst thing uh, you could have is like, to do a show and, like, only a couple of things so right? yeah. or people and, and that's where you got to be careful i think you have to have an awareness of what's happening i think you have to determine how much in the weeds you're going to get in as an artist yeah because you don't want the market dictating what you're making yes but i think you want to kind of understand the climate so then yeah. you can say you know what i'm not going to show this year the market's kind of funky Mm -hmm. I'm going to use this as a year to do some research, mm -hmm. do some residencies, develop mm -hmm. some new skills, take a class. Um, maybe you have some other business ideas you want to do. Yeah. You know, that have nothing to do with art, but also will be satisfying for you. Yeah. You know, just really understanding where things are so that you can really be in the best position for success. Do you feel like 2024 is that year for a lot of artists? It's it slowed down last year. A lot a lot of things slowed down. Um, it's it's hard to say because it's an election year. Yeah. Um, some people think it'll pick up in the summer. Uh, sometimes a lot of that is mirroring what's happening in the market. Some people are saying the stock market will pick up Q two. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say because someone asked else asked me to predict. And I'm just like. You know, the only thing you can control is what you do in the studio and making the best possible work. Mm -hmm. You know, people either going to rock with it or they not. And that's the reality it, of it. Yeah. And I yeah. think because if you're trying to operate off, like, you know, anybody like stock investing one-on-one, -on -one, you can't time the market. Yeah. <laughs> that's the biggest mistake you're going to make. But you can and study the anybody, company. Yeah. Study the company. Yeah. And then try to see, okay. You know, right now, AI is the big conversation, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, everybody's like, get NVIDIA, you know, because mm -hmm. they make the chips. Yeah, but you should have got that a long time ago. <laughs> no, but someone put me on the game <laughs> and they were like, forget NVIDIA, get the company that makes, makes the, the chips. chips. <laughs> no, my husband is, Not um, it. he make he's, he's like that guy that, that yeah, he yeah. told me to invest in NVIDIA. And then years ago, he started investing in, I don't even know who it is, but the person who makes the chips. He has a YouTube channel talking about finance and all that stuff too. I should probably spend yeah. way more time watching his videos. But yeah, like it's, it's, okay. So with that, right? What what do you feel? This is a scary word. And um, I'm going to say it anyway, because I, I think like this. What do you think? about artists understanding that they are an artist, but they are also in many, many ways, a brand. Mm. You have a lot of people who disagree with that. I don't think we found the right language that's appropriate for the art world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I would say the artist is more entrepreneur mm -hmm. and brand may come within that. Yeah. But you have some artists who just want to make their work, which is totally understandable. Yes. You know, but that's why for me, it's important to just kind of understand the fundamentals so that if you hire a studio manager or a studio director or uh, working with a gallery, you know what the conversation is supposed to be. Yeah. And you understand yeah. what role they're going to play. Right. Um, and I think for me, 
you know, I, when I talk to artists, it's about creating a definitive language, right? Or some people would say a style or an approach mm-hmm. that, you know, when I walk into a group show or a museum or auction house or collector's hall, I know automatically, oh, that's yeah, such and such. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, but how do you create a definitive language without being boxed into that? Yeah. Where, like, if you say, okay, I make paintings, but I want to go make sculptures. Or like Titus Kapar, for example, yeah. he got a movie coming out January 20th. Yeah. You know, we know him as a painter, sculptor, you know, co founder of Next Haven. Now he's making movies, right? Yeah. But it's all kind of aligned with the fundamental ideas that he has that undergirds his practice. Yeah. But I think as long as, like, whatever you deem to be the hypothesis of the practice, which you're exploring, the questions you want to ask yeah. are consistent. Um, yeah, it's cohesive. Then I think it puts you in a good place. Yeah. Because you know, brand is brand is a slippery slope because brand also could be like, okay, let me just keep giving them the hits. Yeah, brand and can be just it. like strictly commerce. Which, I mean, is part of the equation. But I think, yeah. I think brand also kind of there's a danger where it takes away the soul from the creative process, right? And so I think it's just like, you know, where you have to constantly just be recalibrating mm-hmm. and being like, you know, where do I sit with the practice? How do I feel about what I'm making? You know, am I making too much of one thing? I mean, you have a lot of artists who like, when something gets too popular, they stop making it. Yeah. Right? Because they don't want to be um, subservient to the market. They'd be like, all right, that's cool. I made like 20 of those. Then discontinue. Let me move on to the next. Yeah. Right. But understanding that you have that power. And at the end of the day, for me, it's just about a consistency of ideas and expression. And I think as long as you have those two things there, it puts you in a good position to make work that I think potentially is interesting yeah. and exciting for you know the public to engage with when they when they see your work. I think many people are going to be sick of me making this reference, but I'm always bring my girl into the conversation. And that's Beyonce. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because I I feel that she's she is, I mean, on a music side, what you're what you're saying, like she has created this language, just like I feel a lot of artists are are striving towards and creating a language. And 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 thank you for that because language more than brand, right? Um, mm-hmm. and if, if your work, even if you do switch over from, I was just talking to Lex Marie, you know, Lex mm-hmm. and how she's making, she made paintings and, and then she started working with material and then she moved over to sculpture. It still feels the same. Like all of her work still very much feels for me the same because it's all core coming from the same place. And, um, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And it doesn't, when I look at it, I'm not confused, even though she's switching mediums. And I yeah. feel the same way about Beyonce. I'm putting Lex and Beyonce in the same sentence. <laughs> but Beyonce. But I think I think yeah. the important thing to be mindful of, though, but there was a moment when Beyonce wasn't clicking. Oh, when? <laughs> this was Are right... you like album like four when she did four? Maybe. She fired her whole staff. Oh, yeah. And hired a new staff. Yeah. Because I was just like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what this is. Ooh. And she and she reset. Yeah. You know, she brought in a new team. Um, I wouldn't say, I think it was just, I wouldn't say it was rudderless, but I think she, you know, the reality is she's been doing this pretty much all her adult life. Yeah. Right? And She's relatively peerless, you mm. know. So how do you constantly strive for more when it's just like when I look left and right, ain't nobody there. She's reinvented you know? herself. She constantly yeah. reinvents herself, but she still feels like she, Beyonce. Yeah, when she did the, um, I think it's the Carter's album. Yeah, with Jay Z. When her and Jay Z did that tour, I think that's twenty eighteen. I think that's when, and then she does uh, what's the joint for Lion King? Oh, which was then, one of my favorite albums. 
you know, lemonade, you know, yeah. then I think lemonade was probably for me the reset. Yes. You just I, yeah, introduced yeah, yeah. a whole visual album, right? Or and even, then, no, uh, okay, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I, I think, okay, lemonade was like the big reset. But B Day with um B Day with what was the song? I can't believe I'm forgetting this right now. It was a they were the video, they were on the beach. I can't think of the song, but B Day was the visual Drunk album. Drunken Love. Drunken Love, yeah. That that was a I soft think, reset. I, I think for me, lemonade, because it was it reset the table. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah. like Nobody was dropping full visual albums. No, not with the story. And I think also just just dropping. Yeah, I think B Day she may have just dropped. I don't remember. No, yeah, B Day she just dropped, but it was a full visual album. Lemonade was narrative, yeah. and I think that's where it shifted. Where like there was a lot more context. Yeah, right, and it wasn't just like songs for songs' sake, right? Mm -hmm. You have now structure, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you see that with Renaissance, there's structure, mm -hmm. right? And I think, because for me, it's like when you at the top of your game, you know, me me and Alvaro Barrett, and we talk about um, changing the sonics, right? So you think about like when Migos come, the whole energy change, flows mm -hmm. change, um, uh, delivery changes, when Kendrick comes, everything changes. So it's like when Beyonce came with Renaissance, I mean, just the tour experience, right? Mm -hmm. So she has us reevaluating what does it mean to go see a show? Because I saw it in Paris. Yeah. You know. Did you see it anywhere else? It was, no, I just saw it in Paris. All I needed to see it once. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen know? it twice. <laughs> but just to see how... Um, it activated these tribes and these communities and what regardless of whether you spoke English or another language, straight, queer, non-binary, yeah. he was able to galvanize people under this umbrella and this idea. Yeah. Right. So for me, that's what great art does. Mm -hmm. Right. And regardless of whether you like it or not, you have to acknowledge that, okay, I think between her and Taylor, um, this past summer, fall, they like shifted the tables. And so yeah. now if you're coming in, it's like, all right, am I going to try to compete with that? Or what can I do differently? Or what can I do that's like totally antithetical to that in order to tell my own story? Right. And I think generally that's what I invite artists to think about. Like, okay, you got the big names who are doing this thing, but you also got big names who like, will do a show every four years because they just want to live their life and raise their kids. Yeah. You know, or learn new skills, like whatever the case may be, right? Yeah. So I think it's just also like putting yourself in position to kind of determine the rules and play by your own rules as opposed to always being in this reactive mode. Yeah. Mm. Right? And I think for me, there's, there's power in being proactive and, and there's power in being like, I... Right, like Sampa, for example, took a couple of years off and drops his record. And I saw yeah. Sampa twice yeah. in like a week span. Because like you could tell he really kind of poured into this project. Yeah. And so, you know, I think just really having the agency and capacity to move as you see fit. I mean, that's the power. Like, mm. not everybody's going to have that luxury. But I think if you do, then I think it really kind of gives you a competitive advantage to really ruminate on what it is you want to offer to the practice. So I want to ask you two questions. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I can literally talk to you about this for like five hours, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> Maybe we could do like a part two or something, but two questions. And then we're going to like transition to um, the glory hour. What, okay. what would you say if you were to set an artist on a career path from the very beginning, I mean, emerging artists, they may have had three independent shows alone. They've started to build a community. They haven't had a gallery. Maybe the gallery came to visit their independent show. They weren't really moved. They didn't 
maybe it wasn't that time their calendar was full whatever and now they're at this point to where they don't know what to do next what path would you set them on What do you mean they don't know what to do with next in terms of their career? In terms of the career. They've had three independent shows. They've Did done the okay. Did the sell out? They'll say, yeah. Okay. And what's their collector base looking like? Like, are these loyal collectors? Are these? Like, yeah, yeah. Let's say that. I mean, this is, I'm making this situation up. But if, if you know what? I'll, I'll bring you a real situation. Yeah, three independent shows. Show sold out. <laughs> <laughs> they have a they have a really great collector base, an amazing collector base that continues to collect from them, continues to to tell other collectors about their work. Um, but they're having trouble getting gallery representation. And the shows were in their city or in different places? The shows were in their city. So I would say get out your city. Get out your city. <laughs> Uh -huh. I mean, I think that's that's because the thing is, it's like depending on where you are, um, that's the danger in being in certain markets where, like, when you're the big shot, people take you for granted, mm -hmm. right? So then, mm -hmm. you know, and I've been telling a lot of emerging artists that, like, all right, it's cool if you had a solo in New York or LA or Chicago, but what does it look like to have a solo in Mexico City? What does it look like to have a solo in Sao Paulo, in Tokyo, um, in Bangkok, in Dubai? So I think really kind of, you know, stepping back and being like, all right, what's my 24 month plan? My yeah. 36 month plan. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's not just about gallery representation, it's really identifying the right partner. I think people are so quick to have a gallery, but the gallery may not understand like the crux of the practice and the nuance of the practice. Yeah. And you really need someone, cause they're gonna be your voice when you're not there. Mm. Right, and mm -hmm. they need to know like the nuance of the practice, but they also need to know your aspirations. You may not tell them everything, but you might say, you know what, my aspiration, you know, I'm studying Russian constructivist art, and my aspiration is to do a show on Saint Petersburg. How do we get to that? Yeah, right. So yeah. I think it's stepping back and really reevaluating what are the goals that you have. Yeah, you know, when the career is all said and done. What are the milestones that you want to have had? Like, is it being in a bunch of museum collections? Is it being in a bunch of private collections? Is it to have a bunch of monographs? You know, is it to be the best-selling artist ever? Is it to have brand collaborations with this luxury brand and that luxury brand? Yeah. So I think it's really kind of stepping back and doing like a SWOT analysis. Yeah. And being like, all right, what's worked in these last three shows? What hasn't worked? And then where's the opportunity that we're not taking advantage of, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I think, you know, when there isn't clarity, then that's when you kind of have to step back and assess. Yes. You know, you know, if you have an opportunity, maybe do a residency, they take you out of your comfort zone. And there we go. Where it invites you to kind of experiment, mm -hmm. right? Because that means that maybe you're, you're not leveraging that kind of opportunity for experimentation. Right. And putting yourself in a space of discomfort. Because if you do three sold out shows, you're gonna get comfortable. And if you live in the city and everybody's like screaming your name, you know, from the hills, it's like you're the best artist in the city. That's cool, but I've seen that also be a crutch. Yes. Where people like because they're the best name, hottest artist in the city, every collector has their work, they're not really doing uh the work to like be like, all right, well. You know, if I'm the biggest artist in Houston, what does it look like for me to do a show in London? Yeah. Is my work going to click for that audience? Yeah. Or how do I have to kind of adapt the context? How do I have to push myself? Mm. Or does it work for an audience in Johannesburg mm. or Cape Town or in Ghana? You know, so I think it's really kind of like, are you challenging yourself? And if you're yeah. not, what do those challenges need to look like in order to get to the next level? Yeah. So if you, you know, could break it's down. It's one, one last thing. It's basically like if you were playing basketball, you're averaging 50 points a game, but you're in the G League. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, versus being in the NBA or playing yeah. in Italy or playing in Spain. So what yeah. are the things you need to do to like get to the 
You know what? That brings me to something else, though, because I was I was talking to, um, you know, Jessica from mitochondria. Yes. So um, we were talking about this we, long conversation about how for me, like when and, and I like that you had like a competitive you have a, a bit of a competitive nature to you. Um, I feel that this exact same way you feel earlier, like you, you, you explained that you felt earlier with we have to. Number one, I feel that we all have to be a proponent and be an asset to the to the next person winning, because if we all don't win, we really don't win truly. Mm -hmm. But I still also agree with your um, your thoughts about being competitive, because, I mean, competitive breeds greatness a lot of times. Um, but to your point right now, I want a lot. I, I want more people to realize that we're operating in this art world on a global stage more mm -hmm. than anything. And, and so we were talking about Houston, you know, I'm from Houston. So I want Houston's mark. I want Houston's economy to be better than Chicago's, you know, and in order for Houston to be better than Chicago, we all have to come together as a community and make sure that we're strong and we're creating a strong sense of community that says out loud in a myriad of ways, we have a similar space here in Houston that Chicago has or that New York has, which is hard, you know. Um, mm. But again, to your point, in order to do a lot of those things, the people within the city have to leave, but they have to come back and share knowledge and give knowledge and drop knowledge, even if it's not for an exhibition. Um, you you got to come back and, and and galvanate the community in a way that is going to make it take a step up. But that's I'm I'm going I'm about to start going on a tangent. So I'm going to pull it back um, to your point of the artist getting out of the city and going to see what does your work look like in London and the conversations that you have. Are they I don't want to say contemporary enough, but have you developed your thoughts and your language enough in a way that they can move beyond the people who are familiar with you? Yeah, because I think the biggest challenge is how are people able to engage your work when you remove context? Depending yeah. on what the work is about. Yeah. Because if the work is um, uh, reliant on being in Houston or being in Texas as a context, and then you're showing this work in Milan, where's the entry point for discourse, right? Mm -hmm. And I think those are things that kind of keep in mind. Um, and you know, and sometimes like, you know, I'm gonna quote the comedian Cat Williams, sometimes you need to, need to get booed. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> you know, and what, is that, what uh, does that feel like? Yeah. And not, you know, to put something negative or something detrimental, but like to understand that, okay, I gotta constantly be trying to sharpen my blade to be the best that I can be and self-actualize yeah. as an artist, right? It's not about necessarily being in competition with each other, but being in competition with yourself. So, yeah. To be the best possible artist and person that you can be. Yeah. I love that. So we're gonna get to Number one, you've shouted out so many people during this episode. Um, and I'm gonna try my best to like make sure that my editor goes in and like puts their their uh, how to find them, but you were like spitting them out like that. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. Um, but do you have anyone else that you want to give a shout out to that we should know about, whether it's an artist or a curator, um, that we should be on the lookout for? Uh, I think shout out to Art Noir, my co-founders. Absolutely. AC, Danny, Jane, Isis, Nadia. I think in terms of artists, John Revis is a young artist. He's doing some cool stuff. And uh, he's going to have a solo show at Francois de Bali. Okay. I think this weekend. Um... Who else? I mean, the artist question is always tricky because there's just so many 
incredible artists. Um, I think I about the Giants exhibition. What would you say? It broke up a little bit. Giants. Giants. The Giants? exhibition with Swiss Beat. Oh, the, oh, oh, Giants. Giants. Oh, yeah. 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 Are you working on the that? No, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm going to approach it as a fan um, and definitely bring the art and the community to that. Yeah. Um, but, but that that's Kimberly Gant. So shout out to uh, Dr. Kimberly Gant um, for working on that. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, Venice Biennial. I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey Gibson representing the U.S. John Akumfra, who's a friend who represents the U.K., I mean Dakar now, Dakar Biennial in May. Yeah, I'm super are, excited about that. Dakar, are you at Dakar? Is where Black Rock is, right? Is mm -hmm. Dakar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So shout out to Black Rock. Yeah. <laughs> shout, shout out to Black Rock. <laughs> I don't know when this is going to release, but the application is still open if you want to apply. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. End of the year prospect. I think this is number six. Miranda Lash from Ebony G. Patterson, the curating. So I think for me, I'm really excited about these biennials because, I mean, these are moments where you get to see artists, hopefully from all over the world, yeah, articulate and express themselves through their practice. And I think for me, that's kind of like the zone I'm in where it's like, I want to see an artist from Pakistan and see how they're thinking about whatever ideas may be on their mind. Mm -hmm. or in the artists from Chile or from Kenya and just kind of like for me this is kind of more of a reset and try to see where the hockey puck is going here oh yeah versus like oh it's going to be abstraction it's going to be figuration I think that's just kind of like too simple mm -hmm. right and I think mm -hmm. it doesn't really allow for the nuance and the layers that the artists bring to their practice so I'm excited to see you know, all the various biennials that'll be happening this year. Yeah. So if you could break down the ecosystem really quickly, the arts ecosystem that a, a young, a budding artist should know, this web, how would you break it down? I would say the artists are fundamental. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then I would say curators, mm -hmm. historians, Collectors, dealers, archivists, art handlers, um, registrars, yep. art advisors. Yeah. I think those for me are kind of like the main writers, critics. We need more critics. Yeah. You know, who really or kind of getting into the meat and potatoes of things. Um, and the public, I think the general public, you know, just yeah. people who are culturally curious. I think for me, if, if I had to make a Venn diagram or a pie, those are kind of some of the stakeholders that I think are important um, in the equation that artists should be aware of. And just kind of understanding the role of each kind of stakeholder Mm -hmm. So it just gives them a little bit more agency when they're engaging and collaborating and uh, working on these projects. Yeah. Okay. So the glory hour. Oh. Oh. And, and museums. I guess. Oh, that. museums. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can't leave. You can't leave the museums out. Yeah. So glory hour is broken down into two small sections, and one is for you to spend a moment. And really think about this because I, I want you to look at this moment as a man. You believe in manifesting things? Of course. Okay. So I want you to look at this moment as a public manifestation of some of the things that you want. Or let's say one thing, let's break it. Let's make it simple. One thing that you want for your career and one thing that you want for your personal life and let's pretend that if you manifest that right now in this moment, it's going to happen for you no matter what. What would those things be? I think for me, it's just doing more shows internationally mm -hmm. and going into markets and communities that may not see and experience some of the artists that I collaborate with. 
mm-hmm. you know. Um, so just kind of continuing to go on that journey. And I think personally, just continuing to challenge myself. Yeah. You know, find things that keep me excited, find things that necessitate me taking things to the next level, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully that in that exercise that inspires other people to do that work and create that challenge for themselves, right? And not necessarily be satisfied with the status quo. Yeah. Whatever that may be. Yeah. And regardless of whether you're in the arts, science, finance, you know, you want to be a chef, like continuing to identify things that allow you to challenge yourself to get to the next level and get to this point of self-actualization. Because for me, Mm -hmm. that's what it's about, right? At at the end of this life, like, did you self-actualize or get close to that? Where you Mm -hmm. were able to be of service, you know, to your immediate community and probably to individuals that you'll never meet. Right. Right. Um, But that you gave it your all and that you hope hopefully inspire someone to take a risk in a moment that they may have had doubt. Mm. I think at the end of the day, that for me is the important thing that like, you're only going to get rewards out of life by taking risks. Yeah. You know, take manage risks. I'm not saying go crazy, but I think like, you know, knowing that you have a capacity to do something and not necessarily always waiting for permission. To go yeah. for that thing. If it's something you're truly passionate about, um, it's something that feeds you, something that you know is going to allow you to be your highest self. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Right, because the only thing that could happen is it's going to work or it's not going to work. And if it yeah. doesn't work and you're passionate about it, then it's like, okay, how do we reevaluate, recalibrate, try again, and then go at it again. Yeah, and it's really. You know, and I don't mean to be matter of fact, but sometimes it's just that simple. Yeah. Right? And I think getting out of overcomplicating things and really trying to do the things that allow you to we talk about manifestation, manifest the best possible you that you can be. Yeah. That's what I need to work on. I overcomplicate too many things. I'm like, by the time I've thought things through, I'm like so many layers deep that it's yeah, but I think simple. But that's what I think having, you know, a writing practice helps right yeah instead of like juggling all that in your mind it's just putting Mm -hmm. it down on paper you know whether that's like a daily diary or just note to yourself and just getting those ideas out yeah and then assessing it and being like all right i wrote down 10 ideas out of these 10 yeah which one which one of these are good (laughs) and which one of these i could kind of execute like now yeah which one needs you know some watering in order for it to kind of blossom mm-hmm. and then which ones are just like not really within not in your heart yeah you know you're just kind of doing it because it's on trend yeah so this next part is a part of glory hour it's expressing gratitude is there someone that you have that you have never publicly given gratitude to that you would like to give it to now you give a lot of gratitude today. You you give a lot of gratitude. Yeah, nah. I mean, I'm grateful <laughs> to wake up. You know, I think, you know, for me, it's always going to be family. You know, so my mom, my brother, my dad, may he rest in peace. Um, my partner, my collaborators in Art Noir. Like, I'm just, I'm blessed to have an ecosystem of people around me who, support me, but then also challenge me, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also check me mm-hmm. when I am becoming complacent, mm-hmm. you know? But I think for me, I, I live my life in gratitude because I've had, you know, some occupations in the past that weren't that exciting or mentally stimulating or spiritually fulfilling. Yeah. And I think to be able to have found something, at least within this moment that provides that, I'm super grateful because some people may not find that in their lifetime. Yeah, a lot of people for a variety don't. of reasons. Yeah, you know whether they they're scared to go for it, um, or circumstances don't allow for it. Yeah, and so for me, I I, I think my life and my actions and everything I do being the testimony, 
being the manifestation, mm -hmm. um, I think is the greatest form of gratitude that I can, I can express. Yeah, well, we we're following your journey on Instagram as much as we can. And, you know, you, you definitely, you, we didn't talk about that, but you have, you are definitely taking advantage of Instagram as a tool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. but the key, but the key thing that you said though, is the tool. Mm -hmm. I think many people look at Instagram as like, it's your savior and it's like, that's not the case, right? I think if you're an artist and you choose to use Instagram as a tool to amplify your work, then you should curate your page as such. Yeah. If if that's yeah. what you want to do. If you want it to be personal, then allow it to be that. Right. Um, but it, it's a tool that for me has been a great form of discovery. I've been able to there's some people I talk to on Instagram every day mm -hmm. more than I talk to people in real life. Right. Yeah. And I think <laughs> we're kind of in that stage of our society where there's a slippage between like, you know, we're doing this on Zoom, right? Yeah. So it's like there's a slippage between like IRL and virtual, but I think as long as you're kind of keeping that human component as uh, at the forefront and understanding that these are devices that just help tell your story, help express yourself, you know, maybe help teach somebody, yes. someone can learn something. Yep. You know, so for me, it's just like I talked about that blog, and I mean, my Instagram page is just an evolution of the blog. If you go back and look at the blog and see some of the stuff I was posting, that's a lot of the same stuff I post on my page. Yeah. It just doesn't require me writing, you know, long blog text. It's just kind yeah. of like I could do it with a picture, with a caption. And I mm -hmm. think you still get the same kind of vibe. Right. It's a visual. It's, it's, we appreciate it. I mean, you're, you're introducing us to a lot of artists that maybe we wouldn't have had the chance to, in real time, get the chance to be. You're bringing us to their studios. I mean, yeah. It's, you know, it's it's really cool what you're doing. So, you know, again, and, and I appreciate one you. More, yeah, I appreciate you too. Thank one you. One more thing, I want to say gratitude to all the artists. Yeah. Um, for trusting me, collaborating with me, being in dialogue with me. Um, Because honestly, without the artists, I wouldn't be here. So I yeah. think I had to give another shout out definitely to all the artists. Same. I mean, honestly... Me, I wouldn't be, I talk about artists all day long here. And, you know, yeah. you gave me also a gem too, because I think, you know, I have this channel. I have, I don't know if you're familiar with at least art group. So I manage artists also. And those are the kind of my two things that I focus on. But, you know, I do have this, people don't know how to introduce me. You know, like, they're like, oh, Mariah, she's, she does this. And, and it's always like cool things that they say. But, um, but yeah, so hearing you say that, I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I'm going to do something with it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you just step back and it's like, at the end of the day, how do you want people to perceive and understand you? Yeah. Right? And so it's just like, when that introduction happens, and, you know, if you see someone that's fumbling, you just step in and just say, you know, I manage artists, but I also have a digital platform that's yeah. designed to educate people about the nuances of artwork. And that's it. So I think really thinking about like in the movie, movies have a log line. So if you were writing your own movie, what would be the log line? Yeah. Right. And once you get that kind of crystallized, then that's how you introduce yourself to people. But I think also to your close friends, like, hey, you know, I noticed that, you know, you were kind of struggling to make that introduction. Yeah. You know, let me clarify what it is that I'm doing and what I want to do so that you know, right. And that's, you know, just taking it to the side so that, like, you know, because they're trying to big you up. Yeah. Right? So it's giving yeah. you the tools to do that. Yeah, you're right. They, it's a, so you see what I'm doing here? I'm like, I'm I'm pulling you in as as my mentor. You're mentoring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so quick. This is going to be fun. Rapid fire. You ready? Yeah. Hip hop or jazz? Jazz. Yes. Jazz or Afro beats? Afrobeats. Nickelodeon or Disney? Nickelodeon because I used to work there. Okay. Marketing or PR? Marketing. Hmm. Wish we had time. <laughs> Cur <laughs> Curating or writing? Curating. Oh, okay. Okay. Wish we had time for that too because I feel like they're one and they, they fit into the same. You got to write to curate. <laughs> mm hmm um for your art collection 
Paintings or sculpture? Right now, primarily painting. Film or music? Music. 80s, 90s, or 2000s music? 90s. Same. Top three artists of all time? Visual or music? Visual. Because we're here, but I want to do music too. <laughs> um, Visual. That changes, but I'll say Crystal Feely right now. Um, mm, we'll get to go to mm. Julie Maratu. Mm. Okay. Kende Wally. Kende Wally. Kende Wally has a show right now going on at the MFH um, mm -hmm. in Houston, man. That's huge. Like, I, I'm, yeah. I, I think you in I'm Waka, I think y'all were the catalyst to a lot of big things that's going on here. So got to like give you love, man. We got to We got to bring you in for like a, a, a crazy big dinner and just say thank you again. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So we already we already gave like you already gave so much advice to emerging artists. Favorite art book. Mm. Uh, Artworks by Heather Brindari. It's favorite first and second edition. Favorite museum. Museum. Take Britain. Most memorable exhibition you've curated. All of them. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let you slide. Okay, the last one I did. <laughs> the last one I did. Um, uh, yeah, I'll say the last one. I mean, the one we did with UBS, Art Noir, it was great. At our Basel. Yeah. Marco Boafo at the Denver Art Yes. They tell yeah. the people they got to know about UBS. I just did a, a video on art market indices. And, yeah, uh, so I mean, UBS is a Swiss bank. They're the lead sponsor for Art Basel Miami. Switzerland and I believe Hong Kong and Art Noir. We, you know, so Art Noir for those who are like what Art Noir you keep saying it. It's a collective that I had the honor of co-founding uh, eleven years ago now, and um, it's a crew of like probably over fifteen people. But in terms of as a nonprofit, it's seven of us. Yeah. And uh, you know, Danny, Cece, Jane, Isis, Melly, Nadia. And, you know, we really exist to amplify the voices of Black and Brown artists and also cultivate the next generation of Black and Brown patrons yeah. right? and making these experiences accessible, whether it's visiting an exhibition or visiting an artist studio or doing the Jar of Love micro grant or the scholarship that we have with CUNY, really yeah. just um, creating a rupture within the art world. Mm. And really creating a safe space, not only for participants, for artists. I've had a lot of artists say, you know, they feel safe engaging with us so they don't feel like they got to perform. They can just be themselves. Oof. I think that for was me, tough. It's they don't like, feel like they have to perform. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it's like you're performing. And I think the less performative a person can be and the more they can be themselves. Yeah. Um, I think that's radical. Yeah. Right? So I think that's what we try to um articulate and celebrate you know through the work that we do as an yeah and it's important work all right so we have just two more two more i have two more rapid fire okay better quick um if you could curate an exhibition in any historical period when and where would it be other than now um I think Renaissance period, and it will probably be like a group show of like highlighting just the Black Moor experience. Ooh, okay. Man, I think somebody, a lot of times, yeah. you know, a lot of times people don't realize that we were present in these spaces. It wasn't mm -hmm. always in a subservient tradition. Mm -hmm. Like not to negate that, because it's just like there's a spectrum of reality yeah. that Black folks have had. And so, like, how do you kind of highlight this moment while it's happening? I feel like you can still do that. Like, I mean, you don't, you can't go back to that period, you know but. <laughs> yeah. 
like you never know. Yeah, either that could happen like for real, you know, with those artists and you know, but art it could be a reimagination. I you know, maybe if we see that come to fruition, we'll come back to this episode and <laughs> <laughs> manifestation oh there we go manifestation all right that's that's really all i have for you today i did want to ask you that as i continue to develop this platform dear glory what aspects um are elements would you like to see from me um i think you know continuing to ask people what their dreams and aspirations are because sometimes it does need to be publicly articulated or sometimes like folks need someone to just ask because I think sometimes you know, we have these dreams and aspirations that we may put in our diary yeah. or you know you're so much on the hamster wheel that you don't even think about those things yeah right so I think it's an invitation to kind of pause and reflect and really think about where you are in this moment and where it is that you be. yeah well thank you so much Larry my pleasure. Thank this you. This has been this really pleasant. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, I, we're at a, a hour and 37 minutes. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, we been... folks enjoy. And there's some jewels and some gems in there for y'all. Oh my gosh. Wow. What an incredible conversation with Larry. I'm so glad we got to do that. What a treat, you know, what a gift to be able to sit in conversation with him and and learn from him and kind of pick his brain. He doesn't know it yet. I haven't I haven't even spoken with him in a while, but he doesn't know it. He's about to become my mentor. I'm pulling him in. Whatever I have to do, Larry, tell me what I got to do. Okay, I'm excited to be in more conversation with you, with him. Um, I'm in. I'm excited to be in community with you, Larry. And I thank you for giving all of the people that are watching this video the things that you've learned for free. Right? We appreciate that, and we appreciate you. Your insights into the art world, they're unparalleled. And every artist should take them to heart. If today's conversation resonated with you, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel, as well as subscribe to my newsletter so you never miss out on more great discussions like this. And if you want to keep up with Larry's amazing work, make sure to follow him on Instagram at Larry Osemisa. Um, I also have that up on the screen. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys for being here. Remember, we're on the road to glory together. And I'll continue to bring insightful conversations just like this to help inch all of us closer to our goals. Again, thank you for watching. I love y'all and I can't wait to share more with you soon. Peace. Thank you, Larry.